I gave OnePlus another shot. They used to be my go-to phone in the past, but ever since they merged with Oppo, things just haven't been the same. But I didn't want to be so negative, so I cleared my mind and secretly started using the OnePlus 11 for four weeks straight before it was announced today. Now at the gate, there's no longer a Pro in the name. Like it's not called the OnePlus 11 Pro, it's just the OnePlus 11. And that makes sense, cause just like its predecessor, it doesn't come with a second variant. They're just selling the OnePlus 11 on its own. Keeps it simple and I kinda like it. What also changed in a small way is the design. It's pretty much the same as the 10 Pro. The only difference is the rear camera module. It's, it's circular now. They also threw the Hasselblad text in the center this time. And the module also has a top glass overlapping all the lenses for a flush feel, which is pretty nice. But shell shock, I personally, I don't like the look of the phone. And it mostly has to do with the big camera module on the back. Uh, with the cameras being stacked in a two by two pattern, it just looks like a giant stove top. And I'm not just picking on OnePlus here. I've said the same thing about the iPhone 14 Pro. These companies just need to rearrange these cameras in a better way. A great move is to go back to centering the cameras like how they did with the OnePlus 7 Pro. I'd be really happy with that design. Or at least centering the circle like how they did with the OnePlus 7T. If I were to point out a modern phone that's done it right though, I would give it to the Pixel 7. The camera bar really makes the phone shine. Still, the OnePlus 11 feels amazing in the hands since you get very premium materials. A metal frame all around with a matte frosted glass for the back, stainless steel around the camera module. The black model even has this sandstone feel to it since there are many micro crystals on top of the rear glass. It did feel weird at first, but eventually this rough texture, it, it grew on me. Plus it keeps the fingerprints away, which is nice. OnePlus is also selling a green model and it seems to have a way smoother back but my other YouTube buddies who got that phone did say that it was a huge fingerprint magnet. So just keep that in mind if you'd rather go with that color. Unfortunately, the phone also has a lower water resistance rating this time around. It's IP64 instead of IP68. So you can't jump in the pool with it or have it accidentally fall in the toilet. But if it does accidentally get splashed by water or you do get caught in the rain with it, you should be fine. The OnePlus 11 is also massive. This is a great choice if you're a fan of big displays. It's 6.7 inches, almost as big as the Galaxy S22 Ultra, so streaming content or playing games on this thing will be phenomenal. But this could also be a downside to those who prefer a smaller phone. I even sometimes had trouble using the phone with one hand, and I'm a pretty tall guy. It especially gets tough when I want to pull down the notification shade or open someone's Instagram story. Luckily, I can still use my one-handed mode feature within this phone, but it's still something to keep in mind. Along with that big size, the screen quality is fantastic and has everything you'd want in a smartphone. It's Quad HD, 120Hz, AMOLED, and also gets way brighter now with a peak brightness of 1300 nits. Not as bright as the iPhone 14, but it's still more than enough for outdoor usage. It also comes with Dolby Vision, which for those who don't know, it's an HDR imaging technology that improves color, contrast, and brightness. So a great option if you're a big Netflix guy. The screen is also LTPO3, meaning that the touch response and precision are much improved. And the refresh rate can't dynamically adjust depending on what you're doing. So when navigating the UI or playing specific games, everything runs between 90 to 120 Hertz. But when you're doing something less intensive, like messaging a friend or watching a movie, the refresh rate gets lowered between 40 to 60 Hertz. And when you lock the screen, the always on display will run at one to 10 Hertz. This dynamic switching really helps extend the battery life cause constantly running at the highest frame rates will kill your battery insanely quick. Actually, there's a similar option for the screen resolution as well in the settings. You can have the phone automatically switch between 1080p or Quad HD, depending on what you're doing. It's a pretty awesome feature that's only available on most Oppo and OnePlus phones. As for the battery, it was phenomenal. I think this is the strongest advantage that the OnePlus has over the competition. With heavy usage, this phone had no problem lasting me the entire day and would even leave me at 30% when it was bedtime. A screen time of around six to seven hours is what I would usually get, and I could probably even push further than that with lighter usage. On top of that, there were even some additional software algorithms to help improve the battery's lifespan. For example, you can keep an eye on the battery's health 
within the system settings to better estimate when it's time to change it. And there's also a new battery self-healing technology that automatically works behind the scenes to extend the battery life even further. So I'm pretty confident that this phone will hold up well in the long run. And if it doesn't, at least it comes with an insane charging speed. It's 80 watts. Meaning that if I forget to charge the phone overnight, I can quickly charge it back up from zero to 100% in less than 30 minutes. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm talking about. Google and Apple need to start paying attention. Also something pretty clever is that the phone is now using AI to determine what charging speed to use depending on when you're charging the phone. It's supposed to help prolong the battery life. Plus the phone doesn't get as hot anymore when you do charge it because OnePlus managed to figure out a way to keep the phone cool even at these insane watt speeds. And a round of applause to OnePlus for being one of the few who still include a charging brick in the box. The only thing is that they included a cable that is USB-A to USB-C. So that's pretty annoying to those who've completely switched everything to USB-C ports. <laughs> that's, that's including me. A bigger downside though is that the OnePlus 11 doesn't support wireless charging. I mean, come on, it doesn't even make sense because the phone has a glass back and a dual cell battery, so you could easily have fast wireless charging. Either way, on a more positive note, the performance is spectacular. It's definitely the fastest phone I've used yet. It opens apps super fast, animations are very smooth, and doing intensive tasks like split screen, screen recording, or even playing heavy 3D graphic games was a breeze. And again, it's all thanks to the new hardware specs. It's carrying the new Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, which improves a ton of stuff. I don't want to bore you with the details, but you can read on the screen everything that gets enhanced just by having this chipset. Plus, you can still pack this phone with up to 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's enough to keep 44 apps running in the background. Yes, you heard that right, over 40 apps. I'm a huge multitasker and a gamer, so having that much RAM is a game changer. And if you do get the smaller 8 gigabyte model, it can still keep as many as 18 apps running. That's still pretty good. And it doesn't just carry any ordinary RAM. It's actually the next generation LP DDR5X, which is 33% faster than what we had before with the OnePlus 10 Pro. The 16 gigabyte model also comes with UFS 4.0, doubling the writing and reading speeds. So transferring files locally was insanely quick. Hell, even just unlocking the phone with the under display fingerprint sensor or face unlock was extremely fast. Granted, I encountered some mismatches with the fingerprint, but it was still much better than many other smartphones out there. Overall, the OnePlus 11 just screams speed, and it's one of the best options for gaming. If you're also wondering if this phone gets hot, because it has such a powerful chipset, surprisingly, it doesn't. It felt cool most of the time, and definitely outperformed the cooling performance of the Galaxy S22 Ultra and Pixel 7 Pro. This time around, the OnePlus 11 came with a better cooling system, carrying a bigger VC cooling area, which dissipates heat even better than before. Every time I picked up the phone from the table, it felt extremely cool to the touch, which is very satisfying. So it's got the speed, it's got the cooling system. What about the speakers? They're incredible. They're dual stereo, so they get really loud without distorting at the highest volume, and they still come with Dolby Atmos to provide great depth and clarity for certain audio. You can even change the sound profile depending on what you're doing within the settings. As I said, it's the perfect option for gamers, especially when using the Oxygen OS gaming app. I mean, the in-game dashboard lets you modify so many settings and includes plenty of unique features like game filters, voice changer, etc. As for the rest of the Oxygen OS software, things aren't so pleasant. It's a very controversial software because most people don't like the direction that OnePlus is taking it. And it's weird because OnePlus keeps saying that they're listening to the feedback, but they also seem to ignore the grand majority who don't like this weird Frankenstein software between ColorOS and OxygenOS. And listen, I have nothing against ColorOS. It's an amazing interface with brilliant features. I've even reviewed a good amount of their software updates and I've always been blown away by many other new features. But OxygenOS also had its own identity that we all loved. The fact that it stayed closer to stock Android while still including those extra exclusive features is what most of us live for. But now, Oxygen OS 13 has moved even further away from stock Android, and it's starting to look a lot more like a cheesy theme with questionable features. So it's not my preferred OS, but it's not the worst out there. In terms of smoothness and stableness, it has gotten way better than Oxygen OS 12. 
They're also promising four years of OS updates and five years of bi-monthly security updates, which is way better than most Android phones, including Google's own Pixel 7 series. So that's a plus. And even though I'm not a huge fan of the UI as a whole, there are still a good amount of the Oxygen OS features that I loved using. For example, I love that I can open any app into a floating window by simply swiping it to the top of the screen. And then I can even share files even faster by just dragging them into another app. Or that I can have my dog outlined in my always on display thanks to the canvas feature. The new live wallpapers that are exclusive to the OnePlus 11 are jaw dropping, especially when you unlock the phone. And I love that I can enlarge some of the folders to access the apps much more quickly. I also need to emphasize the fantastic native screen recording feature. Unlike every other Androids, this one actually lets you record at full 2K resolution with a high bit rate and at 60 FPS. I wish it was 90, but I'll still take it. And of course, I'm still glad that some of the OG Oxygen OS features are still here, like screen off gestures, the customizable status bar, and the fact that I can hide the apps within the app drawer. Well, phone dialer now. I'm also glad that Oxygen OS is still using Google Apps for most of the stock apps. The default SMS app, browser, and keyboard are all Googles. It even lets me disable any app I want, including most OnePlus apps. Even the camera, which is kind of crazy. On that topic, the cameras on the OnePlus 11 are great in certain lighting conditions. And this year, the main focus had to do with portrait shots. I'll explain more in a second. They upgraded all the hardware. The main lens uses a newer 50 megapixel Sony sensor with quad pixel support, meaning that it combines four pixels in one to allow more light to be captured, theoretically improving the low light performance. It's also carrying a 48 megapixel ultra wide, but unfortunately it does have a slightly smaller field of view than before, and it does support macro photography at up to four centimeters. So they ended up removing that extra macro lens that came with the OnePlus 10T. Kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm sure most people rarely ever take macro shots anyways. Something much more helpful would be a telephoto lens, but OnePlus didn't include just any telephoto lens. No, they included one that helps the primary lens take better portrait shots, even at 2x optical zoom. As I said, portraits is where OnePlus decided to focus most of their attention on for the cameras this year. They even told me that they're trying to copy the works of some Hasselblad lenses to make their portraits look like they were taken from a DSLR camera. And I have to say, they kind of do. The depth tracking is incredible, the bokeh effects look a lot more natural and not overly blurry, and the colors are vibrant and fun. Comparing shots side by side with the Pixel 7 Pro, you can see how much better the OnePlus 11 is. It brightens the subject a lot more, sharpens everything a lot better, and provides more accurate colors. Plus, you can still modify the blur strength within the viewfinder. So if you're into portrait photography, this is the phone to get. As for regular everyday shooting, daylight shots were great. The OnePlus 11 has extremely great color accuracy thanks to their Hasselblad partnership. Photos have lots of detail, fantastic contrasts, shadowing, and saturation. There were times when it would even overexpose, but I'm still satisfied overall. Where the cameras really start to struggle though is at night. Now that's not to say that they were terrible. I did get a lot of great shots out of them with incredible detail, exposure, and noise reduction. Plus when capturing scenes with lamps, signage, or other light sources, the OnePlus 11 did a fantastic job of not overblowing these as most other phones do. It just got it right. But there were other times when the camera didn't get it right, especially with the color calibration. I mean, take a look at this picture I took by the poolside. Sure, there was some orange lamps in the vicinity, but making the ground, trees, and all of the chairs look orange is a bit overkill. So when there are a lot of biased hues in a scene in a low lit scenario, there is a possibility that the photos will get oversaturated. For the front camera, it's the same as last year. It's, it's all right, nothing to glamor about. I'm happy that it still supports autofocus with face tracking though, because surprisingly, some phones like the Google Pixel 7s don't do that. And as for video recording with the rear cameras, it was also okay. Stabilization is amazing, but the sensor does get cropped way too much. And the only way to fix this is to enable the digital auto focus feature instead of using OIS. But then you can only record at 1080p. So you literally can't record at 4K let alone 8K, without the image being cropped immensely. 
So you'd have to switch to the ultra wide lens if you want to capture a large building, tree, or any scene that's big. Overall, the cameras were still good though, but they weren't impressive. Nighttime shots were a hit or miss situation. I think the only thing that made it worth the while was the improvements made towards the portrait shots. But then again, I don't take that many portrait shots to begin with, so meh. Finally, let's talk about the pricing. The OnePlus 11 starts at $700 in the US. And then you can double the RAM and storage capacity for an extra 100 bucks. It's also supported by every major US carrier. It's just not being sold at T-Mobile anymore, and there is no millimeter wave for 5G if you have Ryzen. Now, OnePlus did increase the 11's price by 50 bucks from last year's 10T model. But the phone is still cheaper than most big name flagships out there, including the iPhone 14, Pixel 7 Pro, and Galaxy S22 Ultra. But you also have to consider that it's around 100 bucks more expensive than the base model for the Pixel 7 and Galaxy S22. So it's right in between everything. And the only way I would recommend this phone is if you're looking for something fast and with excellent battery life, because this flagship has both those things. It's also for the perfect choice for any gamers out there. Big screen, loudspeakers, better cooling system, and fast charging speeds. Plus, I have a lot of confidence that it can easily be a great phone to use in the long run. It's got a strong update commitment, even though it is running a software that most people don't like anymore. Supports Wi-Fi 7, so if you upgrade your router in the future, you're good to go. And it does have breakneck charging speeds, so even if the battery ends up dying faster in the future, you can rest easy that you'll be able to juice it back up in under 30 minutes. Now, I wouldn't recommend this phone to everyone though. For example, it's not a great option if you want a stock-like Android experience. I mean, I would look more towards the Nothing Phone 1 or the Google Pixel 7. I would also not recommend the OnePlus 11 if you're looking for the best camera in a smartphone. The iPhone 14 or Pixel 7 Pro provide a way more reliable experience, especially at night or when it comes to video recordings. Either way, if you do get the OnePlus 11, after all, you'll still be satisfied with the experience. And that's my full review on this flagship. If you enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up would go a long way, especially since this video did take a lot of effort and time to make. Also, if you really enjoyed what you saw, consider subscribing with the notification bell turned on. And I'll also be tagging some of the OnePlus phones that I've used in the past within the YouTube product tag feature sponsored by YouTube themselves. Either way, if you stuck to the end, I really do appreciate it. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Kapow!